17 to 20. And this section, Paul had left. Notice again, as we quickly bring this to a close, he says, but the, we brethren having been taken away from you for a short time in presence. He's saying taken away is like we were snatched away from you. We didn't want to leave. The idea behind it is imagine this in a picture, in a movie in your mind. When there's the opposition, some robbers coming, some raiders coming to take the kids of an impoverished village. And they drag them and pull them away from the arms of the parents. He says, that's how we felt. We were pulled away from you. We didn't want to live. We want to stay there with you. But we were taken away by force. But not in heart. Our bodies were not there. But our hearts were continually there with you. He continues. And they were more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you. Even I, Paul, time and time again. But Satan hindered us. The word hindered us in there is he broke the bridge. Like that's the idea behind it. You have two chasms. You have one single bridge to cross the path. And Satan keep breaking those bridges so we can make our way back to you. I like that Paul is honest. Notice I didn't say, and I said to Satan, get over here. And I grab you by the horns and I step on your head. And I build myself an old bridge. Is that what it says? It says, you know what? There was opposition and that's okay. That didn't change God's plan, God's purpose. Let's not be fake here. Let's be real. There will be oppositions. God may open doors. Satan may try to close others. And you know what? I trust the God who guides me more than the doors that Satan can close. That is the reality. And he continues... He says, and I wanted to come, for what is our hope? And I want you to notice this. What is our glory? What is our joy? Excuse me. Our crown of rejoicing. He said, not you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, I love that. Don't you get it? He says. <laughs> Paul wasn't looking back with remorse and regret. Oh, Satan, close the door, man. I don't know what to do. No, he was looking forward to that reality of what is to come. Instead of looking back with sadness, he looked forward in rejoicing. Because for the Christian, the best is always yet to come. What is coming is better than where we are here right now. Reminds me of an old story, one of my favorite stories. You probably heard it multiple times, but I'll tell it to you again because Peter said, even though you know these things, I must tell you again. A woman was diagnosed with terminal illness and cancer. She was given only three months to live. She asked her pastor to come up to her home to discuss the funeral arrangements and last wishes. She told him which song she wanted to be sung, what kind of dress she wanted to be buried on, and the scripture she would like him to share. And then she said to him, one more thing, I want to be buried with a fork in my hand. The pastor was a little bit confused, a little bit surprised. Excuse me? <laughs> what do you mean? The woman explained. In all of my years of attending church and socials and potlucks and dinners, I always remember that when the dishes of the main course were being cleared out, someone would inevitably lean over and say, keep your fork. It was my favorite time because I knew something better was coming. Like a velvet chocolate cake. Oh, yeah. Or a deep dish apple pie. Or tres leches. Oh, yeah. Something wonderful, she said. So I want people to see me there in that casket with a fork in my hands and wonder, what's the fork for? Then I want you to tell them, keep your fork because the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Paul looked past his present difficulties and affliction. He kept looking ahead by faith and saw his friends in the presence of Jesus Christ. What a joy. He's saying, I'm not ignoring you. We're not trying to avoid you. We have not forgotten you. We are looking forward to being with you. But right now we can. But I'm looking forward to seeing you there in the 
wonderful gates of heaven. I don't know if you know this. Maybe you knew enough to not know this. We, as Calvary Chapel McAllen, we're looking forward to gather on the right side of the tree of life in heaven. Go read the, new, uh, the Revelation so you can know where that is. By the fruit that produces uh, a leaf in every season for healing, all the stuff. So we're going to be there. We're like, hey, we made it. It's going to be great. Paul has his confidence. You are, don't you know, you're our hope. You're a joy. You are a crowd of rejoicing. It is you. We rejoice. Because you are our glory and our joy. And I love that despite Satan hindrances and interrupted manipulations, he says, we know for a fact that you're going to make it to heaven. Isn't that awesome? Don't you know that you're our hope? You're our cry of rejoices. We are confident that you are going to make it home. They, the Thessalonians, were the, was the cause of their hope and joy. And they were confident that they would make it. They were confident that the Thessalonians would be able to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ one day in his glory. They were confident that they would be able to present them to the Lord as their sons and daughters in the faith. Can you imagine? Hey, Lord Jesus, man. Here's my daughter, Fiona. She's awesome. Here's Emerald. Here's whatever her name is, Lord. You know, I, I will know them. I will know them. Here's a man. I don't remember everybody, but your name now. Uh, <laughs> here's Madison. There you go. She, she's a wonderful lady, Lord. Thank you for putting her in our lives down on earth. What a rejoicing. How can Paul say that? How can be, he be so confident? Number one, because of the way they had received. The way they have welcomed, the way they have trusted, the way they have practiced God's word in their lives. I love seeing people on fire for Jesus. He brings me such a great joy. I love seeing people on fire for Jesus. He brings me such a great joy because you know what? I'm not wondering, are they going to make it? Are they not going to make it to heaven? There's a show on Netflix that I like to watch. It's called, Is It Cake? Have you seen it? I'm always guessing wrong. I don't know. It don't look the same to me. You don't want to be that in Christ. You don't want to be that in that church. Are they saved? Are they not saved? I don't know. You want to have a life that is always pointing out, I'm going to heaven and I don't care what's happening here on earth. I'm going home. The way they had received and they were leaving the word of God, man, was so impactful. They're like, I know you guys are on the right track. We'll see you home. But second of all, because of whom they had entrusted them to. The author and finishing of their faith. That is who was holding them. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, Paul says, that he who has begun the good work in you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Will you say that with me? Philippians 1 6. Look at somebody, or look, just say it out loud because you need to know these things. Ready? Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will be completed until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. You begun it, you'll finish it. He will carry you through. Sometimes when I'm walking my little kids, well, more like when they were litter, Shiloh and Ali at the time, they were tiny little cute babies. And you're walking down the street with them on their hands. And I love how confident they hold on to you. Oh, I got your pinky, Papa. You know, like, and they're tight on that thing. I agree with them. But I knew, I knew they were going to make it to the other side of the street. Not because they were holding on to me. But why? Because I was holding on to them. And I wasn't going to let go. The same is with you and me and the Lord. Yes, we're holding on with the hands of faith. God, I got you, Lord. I got you, Lord. And the Lord says to you and to me, no, no, no. I got you. You are going to make it to the other side. You are going to make it to the other side. You, in Christ Jesus, are going to make it to the other side.
Paul says, yes, we've been beaten up in the city. We have been chased away by envious Jews, the Judaizers. Yes, we're going through real persecution. But it's all worth it because you guys are getting saved. It's worth the cost. There's the greatest joy in the world comes from seeing someone for whom you've been praying for. From seeing someone for whom you've been witnessing to receiving the salvation in Jesus Christ. No wonder Jesus tells us that when one person is saved, in all of heaven breaks out in rejoicing because truly joy and evangelism go hand on hand. They go together. My prayer is that we would never lose sight of the privilege, the priority, and the pure joy of sharing the gospel with Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ with people who don't know him yet. But what if I face opposition? It's only temporary. We're going home. He will deliver us home when he comes. Amen.